Hello and welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Junglist. And I'm Bajo. We're back and we've leveled up. That's right, Series 3, here we come with more news, reviews, and developer interviews you could hope to point a cursor at. And we're not the only ones with a 3 beside our name. Halo 3 has finally arrived. Now, Jung, here's a little interesting factoid for you. Back in 2004, when Halo 2 was released, it achieved the highest first day sales of any entertainment release, only recently beaten by Spider Man 3. The movie, that is, not the game. Well, lucky we've played Halo 3, and not even the Master Chief is safe from our rubber chicken. We've also been hitting Heavenly Sword hard. It's said to be the most cinematic game of all time, taking full advantage of the PS3. But does it live up to expectations? We also ask some of the world's top developers whether or not gaming has evolved to the point of an art form. Hot topic in game dev land. But first, time to stick in those memory cards and boot up the hard drive. Can you name the game for this week? And for an extra point, if you can tell us who the famous game developer was that first worked on this as his first paid gig. Answer at the end of the show. Well, it's been six years since gamers were first introduced to the Halo universe, where they met and played as the last known super soldier, Master Chief, whose mission it was to defeat an alien alliance called the Covenant on an ancient planet-like superweapon known as Halo. In 2004, the story continued with the discovery that there was more than one Halo, and introduced the zealot-like Arbiter, who was well, one-time Covenant badass, but out of self-preservation, turned good. And now, Halo fans around the world are getting ready to put on a brand spanking new pair of happy pants as Halo 3 has landed. Earth is all we have left. You trust Cortana that much? Sir. Yes, sir. Well, this is either the best decision you've ever made or the worst. Hell of it is, Chief. I doubt I'll live long enough to find out which. The Covenant have now invaded Earth, and a huge artifact has been discovered in Africa. It's up to the Master Chief to sort it all out. Now, last season, Jung, you said that Halo 3 looked more evolutionary as opposed to revolutionary. That's right, Badger. You have a memory on you that could rival a fifth grader or an elephant. Well, elephants aside, Jung, I think you were right. Halo 3 is shinier, it's bigger, and there's more bodies lying around everywhere. But it's not the huge jump that Halo 1 was to Halo 2. There's new vehicles and weapons, most of which we covered in our Halo 3 multiplayer beta review last season. But we can say this, every new vehicle, every new weapon, and every new enemy in this game is super cool. We really love the Hornet Hoverjet level, but there was only one of them in the game and we were left wanting a bit more. However, the hectic Warthog mission towards the end of the game made up for it. But tell me, Bedro, about your big stick. Ah, the gravity hammer. Never before have I had as much fun hitting things with a stick. Or you can jump in a vehicle and use it as a polo stick, but it does get a bit messy and impractical. Alongside your standard deathmatch modes and team deathmatch, there's an uber chief versus everyone, a hold the booty, and a bunch of others. But what I like most was the co-op, and it really kicks the fun up a notch when you accidentally power sword your way through all of your buddies. Yeah, you did that a lot, didn't you, Badger? Don't get in Badger's way. If you are doing co-op, it's best to put it on the hardest difficulty setting. Enemies will find cover faster, be more accurate, and throw more grenades. Yeah, and the AI displayed some really smart intelligence sometimes, like when you'd deploy a bubble shield and you'd have a grav hammer inside it. Uh, they'd just wait for you to come out. But uh, sometimes they were pretty stupid as well. Like, you know, I had, no joke, five flood zombies couldn't figure out how to get down a ramp to attack me. And then in one situation, there was a hunter on the other side of a rock. He couldn't figure out how to get around the rock to attack me until I moved. It's happened quite a lot, Jung. And at first I thought they were just trying to find cover, but now I'm not so sure. However, it is pretty cool when they try and jump on your Jeep as you're going along, you gotta shake them off. But sometimes you have to jump on their Jeep and their tanks and plant a grenade or just melee it to death. The Flood and Covenant have very different attack strategies. Halo Combat is designed to be hectic, frantically forcing you to change through all your weapons and grenades and while circle strafing. The action is classical deathmatch and undeniably fun. Killing a brute in a mob will send their little annoying guys running in demoralized fear. Why are they even in the game, Jung? These guys never really gelled with me when everything else is so serious. Why are these guys so silly? And why do they speak English? Yeah. Another thing that didn't gel with me was the inconsistent graphics. You know, often you'd have poorly lit and grainy models would stick out of cutscenes and they were really out of place. Yeah, gameplay scripted action actually looked a lot better. Now, I'm not one to make a big deal of petty technical effects or anything like that. I'd much prefer smart game design over Bloom, but the lack of anti-aliasing in this game was very noticeable. Yeah, you know, HD effects look great reflecting off water and off Master Chief, but every single curved rock looked just ugly. 
However, the HDR effects going from a dark era to a light era were fantastic. Yeah, some stuff did uh, look quite jagged, and I can only assume they did that for performance. I mean, we did get a bit of frame skipping when we had a huge armored convoy of three or more tanks, but that only happened once in the game, so that was pretty good. Uh, the level design in some areas was quite interesting as well, where they'd set up enemies so you'd have to think about how to approach them. But what we're really excited about is Forge. Forge is kind of like a modding tool where you can move items around on the fly while the match is actually happening. So you can put a bunch of tanks near your teammates, but you can make it also so you're vulnerable or not vulnerable while all this goes on. It's pretty interesting. They set a budget too, so it doesn't overuse the hardware resources and stress it out. Um, it's going to be great for machine mode as well. You can record anything from the single player or the multiplayer. You can edit the videos up, share them on Xbox Live, view them from any point of view or from any angle, take screenshots. Here's what Halo 3 lead writer Frank O'Connor Connor said about Forge at E3. Well, the Machinima community is pretty inventive. They were able to make hilarious, sad, dramatic, exciting movies with no tools whatsoever. And now, I think as you've seen in saved films, we give them pretty much infinite set of tools to do whatever they want. And that works in multiplayer and it works in campaign. For it. So for the first time, I think other than just simply re-editing our stuff, they're going to be able to completely reimagine it. And uh, I'm really looking forward to see what can be done creatively with those, that set of tools. Final thoughts, Butch? Halo 3 combines nostalgia with a fresh coat of rumble. The church-like music makes you feel holier than now, but the campaign is a little bit short, and unless you're heavily into online and multiplayer and modding, you're going to feel a little bit let down. 8 out of 10 from me, John. Yeah, it's on uh, normal difficulty. This game will give you about 10 hours of gameplay, but we recommend knocking it up to either heroic or legendary to get the most fun out of it. Uh, multiplayer is definitely where the longevity in this game lies, and Forge has limitless potential for the community. I'm giving you eight and a half polo playing chicken. We've been asking many of the gamers we've met over the last few weeks what they're looking forward to in Halo 3. It has changed, I think, for the better, and it's, there's enough in it to say that it's not a Halo 2.5. I definitely like the, with the whole gravity modifying and speed modifying. Um, also, on top of that, with the new co-op modes and introducing new heroes, I think they have changed enough to uh, warrant the name of Halo 3. I've seen the screenshots from Halo 3 and I can't tell the difference from Halo 1. I may be the only person out there like that. If so, I'm sorry, but not for me, not my cup of tea. I can tell you what they would say. What's that? It's Halo, though! I know, I know, but those are the same people that get excited about Pirates of the Caribbean 3 and the new Linkin Park album. All things that I understand they're good for everyone, but I'm not everyone. I'm an individual and I'm not a fan. The features are insane. Like just, I mean, and then the new maps, but you know, the features like, the, for example, Forge, which means you can go online. It's like a map editing tool. You can't actually edit the geometry of the map, but you can edit like the respawns. You can edit the weapon spawns. You can edit like everything. You can, re you can edit the power of the weapons, the, the rate of fire, the, the gravity on the map. I mean, this, it's like, it's unheard of in a game. So, I mean, in Halo 2 and Halo 1, people complained that like there wasn't enough you know, balance, like the spawns weren't like perfect and you know, this gun was too strong and this gun was too weak and if people do this, it, the, the game's ruined. And I mean, you could edit it to an extent, but in Halo 3, you can like, you can do, you can make your own rules pretty much and you can make your own game types. You can customize everything and it's just, it's, it's gonna change the way that, you know, that these games are made by, you know, developers all around because this is like the benchmark now. It's gonna take a few weeks of solid play by the Halo 3 online community to find out just how good this game really is. We'd love to hear your experiences with Halo 3 or any game you're playing at the moment. Please drop by our forums and leave us a post. Coming up, the first episode of our new animation, Quarter Circle A. But first, here's Gamers News. Oh my god! Good game! Rally car game players are mourning the death of Colin McRae. The 39-year-old Scottish racing driver died along with his young son and two other friends in a helicopter crash. The first title to carry the driver's name, Colin McRae Rally, was released in 1998. This year's Colin McRae Dirt was the latest in the franchise and became the most successful today. The Australian Region 6 qualifiers for the Championship Gaming Series have been decided with imminent triumphant in the Counter-Strike Source competition. The Dead or Alive event was won by Nashius, who managed to defeat Berserk in a reversal of their World Cyber Games result. XCAMX managed to just get across the line ahead of Morpo in Project Gotham Racing 3, and in FIFA 07, Heretig managed to hold off a late charge by the veteran Runaway, winning the final match 4-1. Intel have announced that they will acquire Havoc Inc. 
Havoc are well known for creating the game engine that drives over 150 games, including Bioshock, Halo 2, Motorstorm and Half-Life 2. The right man in the wrong place can make all the difference in the world. Intel says business will continue as usual at Havoc. Good game. Hey Jung, you know what happens when you get hardcore gamers who also know how to make animation? Mm, I don't know. You get this, quarter circle A! We've been playing games for 40 years now, and we've come a long way since pedaling a ball back and forth. To rich, immersive worlds, from Bioshock to World of Warcraft, with creative teams behind them, often in the hundreds. But can we really call these games art? Do they challenge, inspire, and excite us emotionally like true art should? We asked this question of several of the world's top developers at E3. They're absolutely an art form. I think, um, you know, it just depends on how you look at it. Music, obviously an art form. Um, art. You know, creating paintings and drawings, obviously an art form. And I think video games are just an extension of both those things, you know, with music and the interactivity of having, you know, it's basically moving art. I think that, you know, the Metal Gear series from uh, Kojima and uh, Konami are another great example where it's an individual game maker's, an artist's idea of trying to challenge you as a player and want you to experience different things emotionally. And I think they're great examples of how the art of games has evolved too. It, it is an emotional connection between the player and the game maker. If someone could define art for me, then I would know the answer for that. Uh, no, seriously, I, to me, uh, video games are an expressive medium, and that's, that's a more important question to me about uh, than whether or not they're art or not. I mean, art carries with it a number of connotations culturally about you know, whether we respect it or not, or how legitimate it is, but for me, whether or not games are an expressive medium uh, is the core question, and it's a resounding yes, in my opinion. If people knew what it took to put a video game together, uh, I think a lot of people in the world would be really impressed. It's an organic thing. It's a very creative process. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that. They think it's just you slap it together. You write down a bunch of things that you want to do on paper and you go, okay, I'm going to go through that checklist to make a video game. It's great as a basis to write that down on, on paper, but the process, it just it flows. You know, it's an organic little process that we put together. Right now, I think we're in like you know, the early era of games, you know, or like the black and white or the talky era of, of the film industry. You know, um, I think it's more high-powered talents kind of get interested in the industry. It, it'll push it up a notch. Video games are expressionism as well. You know, we, we make games to make you escape from the everyday routine. That's, it's not because we want you to go out and shoot people in the face and all that other stuff. That's crazy. That's nonsense. When people talk like that, the violence and video games go together, that's just that's a lie. You know, people are sick from the beginning. But what video games do is they, they give you a moment of escapism. You had a rough day, you come home, now you're in our fantasy world. Now you get to play around. You get to have fun. And only things that can do that are things that are creative. Books, music, you know, movies, TV shows, video games. So, not surprisingly, many developers believe they're creating works of art. But industry veteran Fergus Erghart believes there's pitfalls for those developers who lose sight of their main goal. I think it's dangerous sometimes when we start actually saying, hey, what we do is actually art, because our job is to entertain. When we forget that what we're there to do is, is to build a product that's supposed to entertain a million people, I think when you just start exploring it as, well, how can we break the boundaries and break this and break that, we forget that, you know, we just want people to have fun. And so, and that's where I think there's a difference between art and what we do. 
Maybe just like movies, some games are more artistic than others. Take this game, for example. Pretty fun, yes, but art? And let's not forget the many games that are now considered a sport. There's also the whole genre of serious games, the ones being used to train, educate, persuade, and even heal. And sooner or later, you have to think about business. It's absolutely true. Games are an art form. We just have to balance it with the business. And uh, you have to start with an idea, though, that is way inside the art territory. And then when you work with it, work with it, work with it, you bring it back over to business. And you won't ever get it to the shelf unless you manage to find the balance. But you have to start with your concepts in the, in the, in the context of an art. A good example of a game that decided not to let business interfere with artistic creation is Ico. Team Ico started their masterpiece on the PS1 before deciding the hardware couldn't do its game justice. So they switched to the PS2 mid-development. The result was the first game to use bloom lighting effects in what was considered to be one of the most artistic and emotional games of all time. But despite its worldwide critical success, Ico only sold 600,000 copies. So as the games industry continues to mature and evolve, the debate on whether games are an art form or not will continue. It's worth listening to the wise words of Stan Lee, creator of Spider-Man, who's seen it all before. When I got into comics years ago, people had no respect for comics at all. In fact, I hated having to tell somebody that I was in that business. People now realize that comics are a breeding ground for some really important legendary characters. Would you say video games are an art form? Would I say that they're an art form? They are like one of the greatest art forms of all type time. They combine story, action, visuals, characterization, suspense. If they don't look right, and if they don't come together right, and if all the elements don't merge beautifully, you, you've got nothing. They are an incredibly complex art form, and I, I'm, I'm in awe of the people who can create them. Good game! I have tried really, really hard to bring this land to order. I have prepared it for a, a brand new era. Have you stopped to think which side you are really on? Some say it's the most cinematic game ever. Others say it's a little more than a goddess of war. I'm talking, of course, about Heavenly Sword on the PS3, in which the red-haired heroine Noriko fights to raise the bar for next-gen gaming. Noriko's clan of warriors have been fighting for generations to keep the Heavenly Sword protected from use, even by themselves. But when King Bohan invades, Noriko has a choice to either use it or lose it. So the Heavenly Sword, once owned by a god, grants great power, but drains the life force of any mortal. When Noriko draws it, she only has a few days to live. I mean, there's things in this game that haven't really been done before. Oh, really? It's like what? Take, for example, the large-scale battles. I mean, games have been trying to simulate a fight in the middle of a large-scale battle for years now, but we just haven't had the hardware to do it properly. That's right, they usually settle for fewer enemies with more hit points. Exactly. In this game, there's over 2,000 units in one battle. Granted, they're running the simplest of AI routines, and you're only fighting them in waves of about 50. But they didn't take the easy way out of just slapping more hit points on them. Another first is the cinematic methods they used to develop this. Andy Serkis of King Kong and Gollum fame led a team of actors through Weta Studios that reenacted every scene in the game. And the result's pretty fantastic, Jung. I've got to say, it's the best facial expressions I've ever seen in a game. We'll cut him to shreds out there. Now I can shower my attentions on you and only you. That's right, although I did notice they used the same actor for every one of Noriko's clansmen. Take a look. Thank you, Noriko. <sighs> Quickly. It's the same guy! One thing we've always believed in is the idea that, a, that games could be a medium like, uh, like film and TV. You know, games are extremely personal and intense when you're playing them, and they, they reach you in, at every level, apart from the emotional level. So we, we wanted to make something that was um, you know, as dramatic as a movie or TV or theatre. So when we met Andy, we, um, 
we went out to New Zealand to Weta Studios, who did all the digital effects from uh, Lord of the Rings. Uh, we took our cast out there, Andy directed everyone, and we motion captured, uh, uh, the motion fact capture facilities was actually more advanced than the one they used on Lord of the Rings in King Kong. And we had up to five actors on stage uh, where we captured their face, their body, and their voice simultaneously. So they played out the scenes as if it was a play. <laughs> Not because you are an incompetent fool. Very early on in the process, four years ago, we wanted to create a sense of um, a sense of pathos, if you like, a, a hero who's really strong but also has a lot of vulnerabilities. And it seemed natural to us to make uh, make the lead a female. When you're playing as, as Nariko, you do kind of um, feel responsible for her in a way, and uh, you're with her kind of in the in the brutal, violent moments of the game, and you're also with her in the very soft moments of the game. Obviously, not every game should be story-based, um, but the ones that are, I think, need to deliver on the dramatic side of things. The result is a game with more emotion. Most developers don't hire screenplay directors and professional actors, preferring to do most of that themselves. But seeing as it takes literally hundreds of subtle techniques to create one emotion in a game, it's a pretty hard thing to do. Here we see how the emotional effect is boosted by people that know what they're doing when it comes to drama. Kneel before me and I will show mercy to your people. But Jung, you can't deny that it mimics God of War heavily, and the epic battles, the swords on chains, and the action sequences. Is that such a bad thing? Well, no, not really, but they did kind of gimp the action sequences. They're too far, so you can't actually enjoy it. Spider-Man 3 did this as well. The buttons are the same every time, so when you die, you already know what you need to press to get through it. It's not as rewarding. That's true, but they have improved on the standard action formula. I mean, they've got the three-stance fighting system, and you can switch between the three mid-combo. The three-stance fighting system adds depth, it looks great, and most importantly, it operates very fluidly. I also think the counter-attacks are a lot sharper and more rewarding. Exactly, and they've got that thing called after a touch, where after you throw something at an enemy, you can guide it to its target using the six axis. Oh my god, no ways! They found a use for six axis? I didn't believe it either until I played it, but it's actually pretty fun. You can use it for cannonballs. Arrows. And even corpses. Plus, overall, the game feels different to God of War. I mean, Kratos is an anti-hero that inspires feelings of awe because he's such a badass. Noriko inspires feelings of respect and honor. She's a true heroine. I gotta mention though, we got through this in about eight hours, so it's just a bit too short. We really needed another three or four hours there. Yep, agreed, though it is a good sign that we're wanting more, is it not? Well, I guess. Well, final thoughts, John. Are we out of time already? Yeah, only 27 minutes in the show, John. You've got about 20 seconds to wrap this up. All right, snap, I'll give it a try. The cutscenes are brilliant. The music is great as well. Every time you check, there's a new song playing you haven't heard before. And finally, a character that scrambles up a ladder instead of letting it break the pace of combat. I'm giving it nine out of 10 red-haired chickens. You know, it's a shame, but I just had to take points away for the short playtime and gimmed action sequences, and let's hope they fix that for the sequel. Ninja Theory have written a sequel, so he is hoping. It's definitely been one of the most memorable games I've ever played, and I like the fact that a hair's always in this crazy wind tunnel. I'm giving it eight out of 10. Time to put you out of your misery, gamers. Did you guess the game for this week? And were there any mega nerds out there who figured out who the famous game developer was that worked on this as his first game? The first game I worked on was Hardball 2. That was a sequel to a very famous game done by a designer called Bob Whitehead at Accolade. I started in May of 88. I was working on baseball games when uh, I'm not really a baseball guy, so it's an, it an interesting story. It was pretty hard to hit the ball, but when you did, it went to a fielding screen that featured some pretty cool character animations for its day. Hard to believe the king of RTS himself, Chris Taylor, started his career on this one. He did the design, by the way. Well, that's it for this week, gamers. Next week, we finally get a look at Super Paper Mario, and we flip some tricks with Skate. And we go to the Australian qualifiers of the World Cyber Games to meet the Australian gamers that'll be taking on the world in Seattle next week. And Lux looks at what your online avatar really says about you. Short, green-haired gnome, so not really resembling me much yeah. at all. 
a little bit cutesy and a little bit girly yeah, as well, Tom. Yeah. What's that all about? Drop by our forums and let us know what games you're playing or what games you'd like to see on Good Game. Don't forget, on the site you can vodcast, podcast, shoutcast, and forecast the show as well. You can? Huh? You can forecast the show. You can anything cast this show. Until next time, gamers, Junglist out. Bye, Joel. Hey, Jungle. Hmm? Want to play a game of speed rating? What's speed rating? All right. Basically, I'll give you five seconds and I shout the name of game and you have to re you have to review it. All right. All right, ready? Bioshock. Ooh, Bioshock. Big game for only a couple seconds. Probably one of the best value for money games you can get. 15 to 20 hours of playtime. Great atmosphere. Blast it! Crush for the PSP. Ah, oh, Crush! Oh, it's got a great 2D to 3D mechanic. It's pretty much its own genre. Nothing else has really been done like it. It's got great music. It sets a mood. It's pretty much built just for the PSP. It's a perfect puzzle kind of game Time. for 10 minutes. Box. Ah! Okay, uh, Guitar Hero rocks the 80s. Oh man, I was really disappointed with this one. I mean, 25 out of 30 songs are totally forgettable. Only two were fun to play. Oh, that's it! Oh, I won! I won. No, I think I won. I did two, you did one. Pretty sure I won that no, one. I won this one for yeah, sure. Let's let the viewers decide who won. No, it's just Get on the I forums won. and say, I won. I think I won.